This podcast is sponsored by Carinia Mails. For more information, email hello at carinamails.co.uk. And this podcast is also sponsored by Sirencester Sales and Lettings. For more information, go to www.sirencestersalesandlettings.co.uk. I have just created something totally illogical. And ahoy hoy and welcome back into the shed for another of your delightful movie heaven. I am here with my colleague Pavo. Hello Pav. Hello. How are you today? Oh wonderful. Life is good. Life is good. Life is very good. Well without further ado we can't mm. waffle on too much. No no no. Time is too valuable today. We must introduce the guest we've got in the shed today. It's Miltos Verolimo. Hello sir. How are you? Hello. <laughs> <laughs> It's really quite amazing to be here. Not as amazing as it is for us. <laughs> Absolutely. I was really... I mean, you know, when you said that you recorded it in a shed, I went, okay, it's going to be a shed. It's going to be full of their equipment. That's going to be something. But I didn't realise it would be like... like a heaven <laughs> of geekdom, of of Star Wars paraphernalia amongst many other things. It's amazing. I'm truly amazed. Oh, you don't I'm know so how glad happy I, that makes us feel. It really <laughs> came to, s- to just experience this. It. It's oh. good. It's made my evening. Well, welcome. Oh, thank you, you are most welcome. Always welcome. Always welcome. Indeed. Well, first off, Miltos, thank you very much for coming. Let's fire straight into some questions to you and find out a bit about your career and that. So when did you decide to go into acting? Wow, when did I decide? That's like saying yeah. that it was a decision. Like, oh, was it? Like oh, a you, choice. <laughs> oh, you didn't have a choice. No, it it's one of those one. things we always say as actors, or at least the, my friends who I kind of know. It's um, it's whenever someone says to you, like, a, especially young hopefuls coming up. Don't worry. Oh, that's just the smoke alarm. I think my house is just burning down. Don't that's worry. Fine. It's that's okay. Fine. We're carrying on it's because fine. this is more important. <laughs> Absolutely, it is. <laughs> so um, I, we we always say, you know, if a young actor comes up to you and goes, you know, have you got any advice about being being an actor? I always say, well, the only advice I'd give you is just don't be one. Just don't be one. <laughs> if you could do anything else with your time and with your life and with your your creativity, do something else. And that's always my advice. And and I think it's the same thing. When I when I became an actor, it was it was like I was doing it as a hobby. I did it at school because I wasn't very good at school, and um, I couldn't quite. It just didn't suit me very much. I was a bit, you know. I wouldn't say that. I just couldn't. It was just didn't sit with me. Mm. I was just one of those kids that just felt a little bit out of place. But the thing that I could do was do the school drama. And that's where I found kind of acceptance. And so I did it and I kept doing it. And I realised I was quite good at it. And um, I'd, I just carried on doing it. And it was never something in my head that I thought to myself, oh, this is it, I'm going to become an actor. Like nowadays, you've got lots of parents who are kind of pushing their kids to mm. do drama school and to be an actor and stuff. And my parents ran a fish and chip shop in Eastbourne. You know, they're, they're traditional Greek parents. And um, and when I told them that <laughs> instead of going to do law, a law degree at Aberystwyth University, I was going to go and study drama, they were like, Oh my God, what are you doing? You <laughs> kill our name! <laughs> Why? We come all the way from Cyprus to educate you and you become a nobody. <laughs> <laughs> right? So so it was never a choice. It was because it was the thing that that kind of, I don't know, maybe self, my mum always says it's very selfish because uh, you just follow your own, you know, desires and your your dreams. But... 
hey, if you're not going to do that, then what else is what el- what else is there to do? Mm. Earn money, really? Yeah. <laughs> well, who needs money? <laughs> no. So you sort of said that you weren't particularly academic. No, I wasn't. But, but when it comes to acting, one thing that has always fascinated me about actors is remembering lines. Yeah, do you, you don't have to be a genius to do that. <laughs> really? Because it always amazes me. Just ha- Do you have a process of doing it? Yeah, there is a process, and everyone has a different process. And there's no, there's no like, magic to it. It literally is as hard as you can imagine it is. Right, okay. So last night I was doing a, um, a casting tape, a self-tape, uh, for a movie. And I had to learn some lines that were quite not very memorable okay (laughs) you don't always get great scripts but you know you have to learn the lines and it's always always a pain in the ass it's always a pain in the ass and um and but you learn certain things so for example with with most actors i think our long-term memory doesn't really exist but our short-term memory is amazing so you can give me something and i can kind of learn it very very quickly and i'll be able to deliver it but within 10 minutes, I will not remember it. It mm. will be gone. So, which okay. is a problem when you're filming on, you know, when you're on a set, because you get given the script, you learn it, and then you have to wait. And then you keep looking at the script, and you go, okay. And then you get separated from your script, and something else happens, you have to go to makeup, or you have to go to a wardrobe, and you haven't got your script and you've forgotten the lines and you'll get called to the set. So that's a bit of a problem Mm. because most of the time scripts change a lot. And sometimes you don't get scripts until the very last minute as well, because people are always working on them, especially on TV shows. Um, Most of the time, if you do it enough, it kind of, it's kind of exercises that part of your brain. And the key to doing Shakespeare is you just keep doing it. And you keep doing it. And the key to Shakespeare, which I learned much to my, to, to, to my chagrin, is that um, you've got to start learning it early. Start reading it early. Keep reading it. Keep reading it. And don't try and remember it. Don't try and sit down and learn it. Just absorb it. Mm. And, and what's really interesting about most lines is if you get enough time with them, they will stay stay in. I have one way of doing it, and it's a fail safe for me. But it's it's everyone is very different. I just write down my lines. I look at them and I write them down. And for some reason, the process of writing, handwriting those lines out, they just go in and they stay in. Oh. Wow! So when you <clears throat> obviously went to to college to do your drama and everything like that, when did you go into the professional side of it? Then was so it quite I, quick after college? Yeah, I, I left. Uh, uh, I went to university, well, it was a polytechnic back in those days, Leicester, and I did a really experimental uh, theatre course. It was a degree, and um, what was brilliant is that I'd been doing uh, musicals in, in school, you know, Guys and Dolls, West Side Stories. I was a proper hoofer, dancing, singing, all that kind of thing. And then I went to Leicester, and I was exposed to the most (laughs) avant-garde Eastern European experimental theatre companies I've ever laid my eyes on. One of the first things I saw was a group of performers hanging from this roof, soaring pianos and furniture in half with chainsaws. (laughs) (laughs) Whilst hanging? They were just suspended in mid-air and they were chopping things up and soaring them in half and there was someone on a microphone just talking kind of stream of consciousness stuff. It was crazy and I was like wow this is the future man this is the future so that was that's really where I'm such a split Mm. you know I have the musical theatre kind of lovey dum but then I'm really I love the most challenging out there stuff and so the first thing I did I ended up working with a a physical theatre company which is strange because all theatre is physical all acting is physical it's not something you can separate but it's a term right (laughs) Mm. it just meant we kind of like we didn't just tell stories with words but visually and um uh and I worked with them for five years and we, it was profit share. So we used to organise, I'm going to say this live on air because they can't get me now, at least <laughs> that's what I hope. So we were all yeah. signing on and um, we weren't making any money and we were, we were signing on and we arranged our tour 
according to our signing on days. Because right. back in that, back in the day, we had to, you go know, in, turn, yeah, yeah. yeah. And so we'd arrange our tour according to us being able to go to to Sunderland and then get back to London in time to sign on and then go <laughs> back up to Liverpool for our next gig. You know, that's how we did it, and we did it in an evening standard van and it was it was you know those are the days and and i learned a lot doing that and i worked with some amazing people and uh, it's where i got a lot of my physical awareness so you know i i approach things in a very physical way very visual way filmic way actually mm. everything that has ever influenced me as an actor and even as a theater director has been film right, right. so when was your first taste of film acting then from that doing some crazy low budget science fiction film where I was playing someone with some contagion I can't remember it's so long ago it's about 20 years ago I just remember filming at night in uh, Holborn right. under, underground <clears throat> and it was just a whole bunch of actors just dressed really shabbily with you know basically we were freezing our tits on yeah. <laughs> in the middle you know early hours of of, of sunday morning <laughs> and then i also did a, an amazing job which eventually saw the light of day and that was another uh independent film and ian jury and billy Connolly were in it oh, wow. and it was a film version of the changeling and that was amazing because that that was great because I was playing it was I was playing um, uh, uh, an inmate in a, a mental hospital and I thought I was Napoleon and um, and Ian Jury was I think Billy Connolly was the uh, the asylum owner but Ian Jury was on that set and oh, it wow. was like amazing hanging out with him because he was like my hero yeah so yeah those were really good days. And did those two films sort of teach you more about how to act on film? Not really, because it was we, we were just you know that the, not really. Uh, and I, to be honest, it, it was. Uh, I don't think I ever really learned how to act on film until really, really late on. I think up until then, I think I was always been been a bit of a late developer as an actor. Because uh, I'm too instinctual, instinctual, you know. I'm very. Mm. I, I, I live. Th- you know i act through my heart i'm particularly latin in that way right um british actors can be incredibly cerebral and that's why they're so good with words you know but uh but i i'm a bit more gutsy and so i always act you know uh, in a very spontaneous and instinctual way and um and so that was always the way i kind i didn't really overthink anything Mm. but recently recently and and i would say within the last five six years i have found a a way that i approach filming which which works much better sometimes i still need to be reined in a little Mm. sometimes directors (laughs) always say to me yeah just just don't do as much (laughs) right right right. because i can you know you Mm. see you know you're sitting opposite me i'm quite animated Mm. and i feel incredibly like i feel quite (laughs) claustrophobic in this little shed but but that's 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 my natural energy yeah but what i love the most about acting is is trying to do something that isn't what comes naturally so the parts I've enjoyed the most are the ones that are so unlike me, mm. where I have to be incredibly reserved and contained. And that's why playing characters with evil intent is always so much fun. Right. Because I think that's easy to do. Mm-hmm. I mean, nothing's easy to do, but it's easier. <laughs> <laughs> because you can, I don't know, there's something about that menace that is, it taps into something that we all... Well, there's no Use. restrictions, is there? Yeah. You, the people that are evil don't care about anything, yeah. so it's quite nice to play that kind of yeah. thing. Yeah, yeah. Now, obviously, we'd be remiss if we didn't talk about your uh, iconic character from Game of Thrones, uh, Sirio Farrell. Uh, how did you? How did that all come about? I knew uh, Nina Gold, who is the casting director of Game of Thrones, and someone who has been incredibly loyal to probably everyone that she knows. But but she saw me very early on in my career. I think I was doing something, playing some 
some superhero called Fluff at the old Red Lion in, in, in Islington, <laughs> dressed in just like a kind of pink briefs. <laughs> Honestly, it was as ridiculous as that. I'm not exaggerating. Okay. And uh, it obviously left an impression on her. <laughs> so uh, right. So uh, she's always been fantastic and always got me in for things. And Game of Thrones came along. I mean, she was an amazing casting director, but she's now and a huge casting director now. So, so that was great. And she got me in and, uh, I think they were giving scripts to everyone, you know, it was such a big cast they were looking for. And, uh, she gave me Lord Varys to read and she liked the, uh, they liked the reading, whoever they sent it to someone at HBO, maybe Dave and Dan. Um, but they didn't think it was quite right. So they sent back, but they went, Oh, I know what we should get him to read. And they gave me Sirio Pharrell to read. And it was the three and a half minute scene, the first lesson with Arya. So as you imagine, like I said, learning lines is not easy. Learning lines is even worse when you're doing it for a casting that you kind of want. It's great when you go to jobs that you don't want. Right. There are some jobs that someone, something you get told and you go, oh, God, all right, I'll go to that, but I don't think I'm going to, you know, start mo- moaning to yourself. <laughs> and those are always the jobs you get because you go in there completely confident, not what, not a care in the world. And they always just go, oh, he was, he was like so kind of confident and relaxed. It's like giving the job. And then you get given the job and you go, but I didn't want that <laughs> job. I wanted the other job that I really, you know, messed up because I was so nervous. Right. Um, so, so we did that. Uh, I did the reading. It was like went on forever, but I did it. Um, and uh, Robert, her assistant, who ended up being in the first se- season, uh, was reading Aria. And uh, he was amazing. And I, to this day, I will always say, and I think everyone who was in that season and subsequent seasons, I imagine, always owe our, our uh, roles in Game of Thrones to him because he reads so well right. that he makes you good. There are so many times when you go to a casting where there's no one to read with. So you're doing a dialogue and the casting director won't even read with you. <laughs> so you kind of have to just read the bits reply imagine the reply you know like it can be really that surreal Mm -hmm. but he was just giving it 100 percent aria and it was like it just made it so much easier and i will thank him to the day i die for that um so so that's what happened you do one casting and you forget about it immediately because you don't we don't keep these things in our heads because if we if we got excited about every job we went to we'd be <laughs> delirious yeah, yeah. and always disappointed you know <laughs> right, right. so so uh so um i did that and forgot about it and then a few weeks later came he said oh they want you to to do go back and see them uh you know your buttocks clench a little <laughs> and go oh really okay just do exactly what you did just do it again so you go back and you do it, forget about it immediately. And a few weeks later, they go, oh, they liked it. They go, Could you, would you mind going in again? I'm like going, <laughs> now it's getting quite exciting. And you're trying right. not to be excited about it because you know that it's not going to lead to anything. That's, that's the mindset you get into. Mm. It, it's very useful. It's, Is that crucial as an actor that you, you have let, to just let things go? You have to let them go because... Right. Uh, I've even, you know, been offered jobs. So there was a Western I was going to do with Brendan Fraser. And they'd uh, built the sets and we were all, like, all cast. We were all ready to go. And then the money fell out, oh, fell no. away. And it just never got made. You know, so things like that happen all the time. So you mm. have to really develop this kind of sense of going, it will happen when it happens and don't get... I mean, you, of course, it's not very easy to do, but I tell you, it's much better for your heart and mm. for your soul if you just let these things go. And when they happen, they happen, and they're exciting and brilliant. Mm. But, but you can't dwell on them too much. And luckily, if you're busy, there's always another thing to kind of worry about, so it's fine. Um, so it got to, I think, the fifth time, and then on the fifth one, they said, oh... HBO are coming over from America to meet you in person. And that's when you go, oh, God, oh, my God, this is not what I want to do, because you know you're this close, Mm. right? And that is the problem. Right. Because when you know it's a vague possibility, it's fine. You can handle it because you, you don't entertain the thought. But once you know you're that close, that it's between probably you and one other person, 
that's when you lose your shit. Right. Do you ever know who the other person is? No. Right. No. There's nothing on, a, on like an actor's grapevine no. where someone was saying... I mean, I'd love that. One day right. th- those things get published, but, but no. And I don't know many... There's always those stories of people that turn down parts yeah, that yeah. other people got. Right. But you don't ever hear the the between the one person and the other. Sometimes right. you find out. Sometimes, but it's very rare. Right. So, yeah, whoever it was, I was hoping it was like someone like Ben Kingsley. <laughs> 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 Such a... What an egomaniac I am. <laughs> and why not? And why not? So, I was going to say, how much of the character did you actually know when you did the rehearsal or did the audition? I read the book before I w- did my casting. Right, okay. That was the first thing. I got right. a breakdown. All right, right, I'm going to go and get that book. And I read it, and um, I was like, oh, I thought it'd be in it more. What? He's, he dies at the end. No, uh, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you do that. And um, and as you know, he's quite an enig- enigmatic character. Yeah, absolutely. So you, do the re- you read it, you know as much as you possibly can know, and then you just forget about it. Because ultimately, like I said, I'm not a particularly cerebral actor. I just decided just to to do it from from whatever my instinct was about him mm. and um i don't know all these things inform your imagination you know when you think of a swordsman a pretty um special swordsman and then you think about you know and of course you can't help but your mind turns to all every sword fight you've ever seen on film everything from errol flynn mm. to to um um Inigo Montoya, yeah. Princess Bride. Yeah. Uh, who's that actor? Remind um, me. Oh Dari Hours. No no no, 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 no. The other oh. one. Come on. Mandy Patinkin. Mandy yeah. Patinkin, yeah. who's like such an amazing actor anyway. Um, so although, whether you like it or not, whether you want it to happen or not, that you can't help but those things flood into your head. Especially if you've watched the films I've watched. Um, and that, and that uh, you know... Even if it's subconscious, those things affect it, mm. you know. And I and I, I kind of like that because it's a little bit like alchemy. It's not deliberate, but there is a consciousness about things, and people can't help but bring certain things to other things. Like even sometimes I think about uh, George R. R. Martin and writing a character like Cyril Farrell, and you can you feel i don't know whether it's true i never spoke to him specifically about it but you get this feeling that these unconventional teachers are something that have always been in narrative stories you know even mm. think about something like star wars which in the shed is surrounded by star wars things. <laughs> but this the idea of you know obi-wan kenobi the way that, that that character is created so that it's like a catalyst for luke's story mm. it, you know you feel a similar thing going on you know um and and uh, these these kind of things are they influence you. You can't help but let them influence you because it feels that that is where our storytelling has always come from. You know, mm. the things we watch, the things we read, the things we experience. So, did people on the set realize how big Game of Thrones was was going to become? Because it was obviously the first season, wasn't it, that you were in? Yeah, I don't know if anyone. I mean, we knew the books were successful in America. We knew that they were bestsellers. We knew that they were they'd been around for a long time, but I mean, you can have a successful movie series like The Sopranos mm. or True Blood. You can have that, but it's a different thing when it becomes so successful that it 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 becomes a cultural it has its it has its own cultural place amongst everything else. Um, it gets name checked in the news. Yeah, you know, mm. it's like that. That I don't think anyone really expects that. That is just something that, that that other people do to it by loving it so much, or or because it's in our imaginations. I still don't know. I don't think you can ever plan. This is the brilliant thing about successful films and TV shows or books, whatever it is. There are no. There is never. In fact, I cannot. I'd love someone to tell me if it's true. Someone who created something who just went, you know what? We knew when we made this that it was going to blow people's socks off. Yeah. 
But I guarantee you there is not a single person who knows that. Mm. It happens because you make it for the right reasons. Dave and Dan created that and George gave them, trusted them to make this TV show because they showed him something in their enthusiasm or in their knowledge or in their attitude to how they were going to do it. They showed him something that completely made him go, yeah, okay. Because, of course, he's the kind of person that doesn't have to do anything he doesn't want to do. No. You know, he works on his own terms. He's been around a long time. He certainly doesn't need the money. That is something that he he just needed to do. And they made him realise that this needed to be turned into a TV show. And he, and, and he went, OK. And, and that is the reason why it was successful in the first place. Mm. Everything else is just magic yeah mm. <laughs> you know so what was it like then <clears throat> once you got the job and you walked in for the first time did you have like rehearsals and everybody together we had a read through right of the first three episodes okay and that was amazing it was in a spiral there were so many people in that room that they could they had to do it in a spiral oh really and i sat right at the end with peter vaughan yeah and he said to me, dear boy i, I my eyesight i can't actually see anything but i've learned my lines so if you poke me every time it's my cue then i'll <laughs> i'll say it he was such a sweet man but then i got moved from him and they said no 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 you've got to because you're in the third episode you've got to you've got to sit closer into the middle so i was ended up ended, ended up being behind uh, lena and uh, i was like oh god <clears throat> i mean i was i was like i felt completely out of my depth um but but that's a strange thing because there's one if there's one thing about syria it's that he is nothing but confident i know all the time yeah isn't he everything he does everything he says is done with a confidence yeah. so to hear you saying that you you're going oh my god how did you when you start reading your lines <laughs> does it just like a, a switch you're going oh my I god and then you're, there uh, is something no. mentally wrong with me right. sometimes <laughs> okay i was talking about this to a friend of mine and i was saying oh. i think i've always i always come across in a certain way whether i'm on stage or on film and i always look very assured i always kind of uh, you know I, funny i on stage i play quite low status characters like fools and clowns and idiots and and i seem to do that very very well it's very <laughs> easy for me to do that because that's kind of much more closer to to to, to who i am because i don't really take things very seriously or i i like to see the absurdity in things but but on film I always play quite high status characters, doctors or kind of swords masters or things. And so so I realised that on the inside, and I was saying this to people, that on the inside I'm like going, this is what's happening in my head. What's my next line? What's happening over there? Don't look at that camera. Do not look at the camera. Do not be aware of where the camera... Oh my God, what's she... Why are we doing this? Do we have to do this again? Oh my God, what's the next line? What's the next line? I can't remember what my next line is. And then it comes out, of course. That is what's going on in right, my head. But right. on the surface, it's like super cool. Yeah. But inside, it's chaos. Right. right. And it's that tension, which is what... I mean, it, without sounding completely pretentious and completely like an asshole. <laughs> The reality is there is this tension that goes in for a lot of us uh, who do kind of acting or mm. anything like that. The tension is where it where it becomes exciting. You know that thing when people say, oh, there, that guy, is, you, can't, you can't take your eyes off him, or that girl, she's so intense when, you know, you just want to watch her all day long. Yeah. It's because of that tension, I'm sure of it. Because I don't know one actor that just goes, you know what, I don't really... Unless they're very drunk. Right. Because that's very <laughs> easy to do. <laughs> I'm just very drunk, so I'm just going to just do whatever it... Whatever, whatever I'm going to do, you're going to like it. <laughs> and that's the end of it, right? So, so there's that. But I think most of us turn up, because we don't have rehearsals. No. We have a little bit of rehearsal, but not very much. And most act directors rely on that. I did a small scene on the Danish girl, and um, and uh, oh god, oh my god, Tom Hooper. <laughs> I almost forgot his name. <laughs> um, Tom Hooper yeah. r really plays on that. 
he doesn't want you to overdo it when you right. And he wa- he will want to see a rehearsal, but the minimum. And he will always remind you. Some directors don't remind you, but he will always remind you and say, "Please don't don't give it away, don't give it away," because he knows that really, the best take you're going to do is really in the first two or three. Mm. Usually, it's the first one. So if he can rehearse it just for cameras, and that's all he's rehearsing it for, not your performance, mm. only the cameras, then that's all he needs. He needs to know that he can get the scene without any technical problems, and then he lets you do it. And that's why he's fast, and that's why he always gets really good scenes, because he's dealing with drama. Mm. And you can't do that over and over again, no matter how good an actor you are. There are some actors who just know... They can just do it because... But that's exper- only experience teaches you that. It's not like some magic that an actor has. It's just experience. But most of the time, if you're a good director like, like Tom is, he just knows. He knows how when you're going to do a good performance. He knows before you do it. And that is what makes him a genius. Right, right. It's really clever. Right. Before we get on to our movie heaven questions, I've got one more question. We'll also talk a little bit about Star Wars later on. Is Sirio Pharrell dead? I just want you know. I mean, obviously, Miltos has got. I'm the, locked in a shed. <laughs> what, what, what's the worst thing <laughs> yeah. that's yeah. going to happen? We have other guests' heads all on <laughs> yeah. the wall. You actually do, actually. <laughs> yeah, he's not lying. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's like our trophy room. It is our trophy room. Yes. <laughs> so, yeah. just another quick one, Miltos. So, when you did that reading with all the Game of Thrones cast, and obviously there was a lot of named and um, big actors around you, do you ever get starstruck when you're in a situation like that yourself? I don't think I get starstruck. I don't think that happens. But the nerves come from just the 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 event, you know, because I don't know, it's it's hard sometimes. I it's I I I don't know if it's really true, but it's very hard sometimes to to kind of walk into a room and just go I belong here. Mm. I, I just I don't know maybe one day if I've been doing it long enough that will happen but I don't think so because every job is different yeah. every room you walk into is different and and I think it's the scale of the event that kind of makes me want to go to the toilet <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 and yet that is also which gives you that that mm. fire right. that thing that makes you I mean, I worked my butt off for that for that role, and and I made sure, and it it seeped into my subconscious so much that I did things that I didn't even rehearse with the stunt coordinator. There was one moment in the first lesson where I flip the sword over and catch it on the back of my mm. hand and balance it. I'd never done that before. I'd never even thought of doing that before. But literally, as we were about to do the take, I thought to myself. Wouldn't it be so cool if I could just do that? And I did it, and I almost corpsed myself on camera because I did it, mm. and I didn't expect it. Because I thought, oh, maybe I'll try it. I didn't. I don't know what overcame me, but I just thought I'd try it, and I did it, and I actually caught it as I was doing the scene. Right. And for a split second, I was like, <laughs> 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 and and, uh, and 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 I could see Buster Reeves, who is the stunt coordinator. Uh, at the back of the room going he's never fucking done that before and, uh, what's he doing how did that happen <laughs> like it just some kind of weird zen came over yeah, me right but I just think it's amazing the thing that you can do if you put your mind to it were you trained anyway to use swords or anything no not trained but I'd done a lot of it right. I did a lot of it at the Royal Shakespeare Company and I have a dance background, you know, the musicals. Mm. I have a dance bra- background, so picking up choreography was quite easy for me, and, and Maisie as well, because she did dance at school. Yeah. Um, so that was that was fine. But as soon as I saw my stunt double, who I actually knew, I knew him, and uh, in the in the curly wig they'd, <laughs> they'd got him, <laughs> I was like, that guy is never, never getting on screen, because <laughs> even from the back, he looks ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> but you can tell that's a wig. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Right, so let's find out about some of your film choices then, Miltos. Let's find out what you like, dislike, and things like that. So what was the first film you saw at the cinema? Uh, it was The Big Boss. 
Bruce oh, Lee. Oh, Bruce Lee. Yeah. So, I was far too young to be allowed so to say. see it, but my dad took me. My dad was a big uh, Bruce Lee fan. And uh, this is back in the days when people didn't really... It was in the afternoon, you know. And uh, I think I might have been about 12. Maybe I might have been younger. But anyway, I went to see it. And that was the first film I remember being completely blown away by it. Because it, it is quite violent, obviously. Yeah. I mean, body parts in ice cubes and things <laughs> like that. I don't remember any of that. Right. I just remember Bruce Lee and how acrobatic it was. Yeah. Were you a Bruce Lee fan or was it just Only after dad? that. Right. My, oh, dad, right. my dad used to talk about it all the time. He used to talk about Bruce Lee all the time. Yeah. Yeah, that was the first film. And that, was, that left a big impression. Mm. And interestingly enough, has kind of informed the way the things that i love and the, the way that i mean you know that that the the balletic quality of of what he did was so amazing and the discipline and the fact that there was a he it felt like he was an artist do you know what i mean mm. even though we weren't aware of it at the time i wasn't aware of it i just remember seeing these films and thinking to myself wow this is this is unlike anything I've ever seen before. Um, but seeing it on the big screen, that was, that was quite intense. Yeah. And the sounds that used to come out of his mouth. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm a big fan of Bruce Lee films. People forget that, uh, you know, he was at the top of his game in the martial arts world anyway. He's probably yeah. the world class. He was a teacher. He, he was. wrote books about, yeah. about, he, about he it. He created his own martial art. Yeah. And people yeah. forget that that's what he did, yeah. as well as just become a film star. Yeah. Right then, now you say about how remembering words and remembering lines. What was your favourite movie quote? I just told you I'm rubbish at learning lines. <laughs> exactly. Um, my favourite quote. Well, I've been thinking about this because I, I remember you telling, asking me this question before. But, but I'm sure I had a good one. But, but right now, it's it was always a toss up. But right now. I love that Dennis Hopper in Apocalypse Now when he meets Martin Sheen and he's talking about Kurtz and he's going, mm. when it dies, man, he dies. And when he dies, man, it dies. And it's like, <laughs> I can watch that. Him doing that repeat over and over mm. and over again. Completely, whatever he was on, I don't know, but that... And it is... wasn't scripted, was it? Of course it wasn't. No, That's yeah. why it's so it, good. It's and amazing. You can tell. I mean, he, I, I don't know what planet he was on <laughs> when he was doing it. We don't know. I mean, I don't think we ever will, will we? That was Dennis Hopper's version of balancing a sword on the back <laughs> of his hand. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but the thing is about these lines, you know, you think about... Um, I'm sure, you know, when I leave here, I'll go, Oh my God! how could I have forgotten this? But the point is, it's, it's not a great line, but it, I, it's stuck in my head. Mm. And I, ne I will never, ever forget it. I'll never forget that look. And the, and the feeling that I had when I was watching it for the first time, I was genuinely like, I don't understand what he's talking about, but it's really, really intense. And it's really <laughs> exciting. And that's mm. very much what that film was, was like from beginning to end, wasn't mm. it? Mm. Yeah. It's a masterpiece. I think it's an mm. absolute masterpiece that film absolutely right Miltos so do you buy many films yourself uh, I've got a sad story I used to collect DVDs and then obviously Blu-rays when I when I did but uh, when I was living in London a few years ago I think maybe about five years ago I got broken into oh, no. and they stole my whole collect a collection that I'd been collecting since I was you know as as soon as they were out so i had a lot and they took every single one oh, no. and then and then i and then after that you know everything's like streaming you know you buy your you know your computer and it doesn't even have a hard drive in it anymore or a zip a, a cd no drive. yeah yeah so so the so the idea of buying them and then certainly i was like i'm never going to be able to replace them so so yeah i don't do that anymore so it you do like, stream, though? Yeah, I do, yeah. What was the last film you remember watching on the streaming devices? Up. Oh! oh. Yeah, and then up. cried at the beginning, like we all Heartbreaking, yeah, first 15 minutes. so days. beautiful. Do you know what? I've got that 
when I got bought my new TV, which is like some 50 inch super high definition thing that is bigger than my front room. <laughs> <laughs> and I sit like glued to the front of it, like a, like, I don't know, like a pet. Mm. And it, and that film was the one I wanted to get. I thought it had to be something that would just show it off. Mm. And it was so beautiful. Yeah. I loved that film. Great film. It is a gorgeous film. Right. Are you a horror fan? That is, is my reason for living right okay. i love horror more than anything okay so this will be genre. interesting what's your favorite scary moment in a movie god there's so many there's so many and some are genuinely scary like things from uh <sighs> rosemary's baby I remember though a lot of those scenes that kind of psychological horror of you being from you know Mia Farrow's point of view and like you're not sure what's going on those moments where she's she's seeing people whispering through doorways and that used to chill my mm. blood uh so that was amazing then there's other stuff like uh the moment in the original Texas Chainsaw Massacre where the, and this is like just genius just from a filmmaker's point of view where the very first time one of the kids gets hammered and falls over and you see it from the other person's mm. point of view through the doorway it slides open that sound of that, yeah. that door sliding open and then and and then the way that he just dro- i mean it's horrible just to describe <laughs> it the way he falls like a sack of potatoes but the only thing that's going is his is his is his foot twitching in that kind of level of detail I will never ever forget mm. and it still to this day kind of upsets me when I think about <laughs> it yeah. mm. and it's the, always the slamming sa- door as well <laughs> the, <laughs> the soundtrack on the original Texas Chainsaw Massacre we've spoken about it before just freaks me still yeah, it's so it's that good strange screech yeah. throughout it oh. sounds like animals doesn't yeah. it oh yeah <laughs> so so there's it's I, those extremes I mean I'm not so I, you know I'm I'm really not a fan of uh of Eli Roth's kind of the torture of porn stuff. kind I of really stuff. I really don't right. like it. But but I recently saw a f- well, not recently, but it it stayed with me since, and it was Absentia. Do you know Absentia? Is that the one? No. It was made by the guy that then did Oculus. Right. Oh, right. Okay. okay. Yeah. I've not heard of that one. So Oculus is okay. It doesn't it doesn't really float my boat really, but. Absentia is his first film and you have to see it. Oh, oh really? You okay. need to find out what, what, what his name is. I, I really apologise for not knowing. Uh, it's very disturbing. Oh, really? Very real. There's a sequence in it which is just a girl putting her headphones in and going for a run. She runs through this underpass. And underpasses are kind of creepy places anyway. But the way it's done, you just mm. go, there's something not right don't don't run through the underpass and she does it regularly in the film and it's like every time it happens it's like you just kind of like sink into the chair going oh this doesn't yeah. feel right but it's a beautiful piece of very small budget intense filmmaking and i if you haven't seen it see it yeah. written and directed by mike flanagan there you go yeah oh, i'm gonna have to very, check that one out yeah absentia you see, I, I've come to the conclusion that the um, the younger generation who like horror now very much find the scares are just jump scares. So they're like your ghost train rides yeah. of films. And the psychological aspect of horror, because I've always said like The Exorcist, so many younger generations say, well, it's not scary. And I think, it's terrifying. And they don't get the psychological aspect anymore. It's gone. It's sort The of- imagery of... Of the staircase, just those mm. stairs and the house and yeah. the light at the top of the window. I don't know whether, it, I don't know why that doesn't have an effect. Maybe it does still, but that, just that image mm. and the soundtrack, that's all you need. Exactly. And I want to go and hide <laughs> well, I, I, always, I, I mean, I always remember the very first time I watched it. I love horror myself. Yeah. And I watched that and I was probably only about 13 or 14. Yeah. And I was watching it and I kept thinking to myself, don't go upstairs. You don't need to go upstairs. <laughs> just leave her up there. She's tied up. Just don't worry about it. <laughs> just go. I know, I know. In your mind. And, I know. And I know. now, showing or seeing it with generations a lot younger than myself, like my son, 
And he goes, well, that wasn't very scary. Really? And I'm thinking, wow. what am I missing? But then he watches something like you're conjuring or something like that. Well, that was terrifying. And I'm sat there going, that wasn't scary. That was just so like was, pyrotechnics. Yeah, it, well, like it? I say, it's a ghost train ride, isn't it? Yeah. It's just quiet, quiet, boom. Mm. Yeah, yeah. So, Miltos, do you like comedy? I do like comedy. Good. What was your favourite com- comedy moment from a movie? Mm. Oh, God. It has to be something from uh, from from uh, things like um, Blazing Saddles. I, I <laughs> There's so many moments from that, but most of it, uh, it's usually when, Mo- I think Mongo punching the, <laughs> the is it the horse? <laughs> the yeah, horse. It's, it's like so gratuitous. <laughs> I think I like things that genuinely shock me, like right. where I just go... <gasps> I yeah. can't believe what I'm watching. <laughs> yeah. It's usually mo- really inappropriate things. Yeah. Um, so I, I love things like that. And I, and I love um, uh, Steve Martin films. Those Steve Martin films like uh, uh, The Man With Two Brains. Oh, yeah. yeah. Those, Those kind of things. The Jerk. When, you, when, you, when, you, when are you planning on uh, having your fingers <laughs> removed from your chin? Oh, yeah. You know, ridiculous stuff like that. <laughs> so, so I love that. But, but more recently... Stuff. Uh, the thing that really, really made me laugh, and even now when I keep when I w- <laughs> when I watch <laughs> it, that stupid scene from Meet the F- Meet the Parents, the very first one, yeah, where Ben Stiller and Ben Stiller. I mean, you know, he has he, God. Sometimes he really annoys me, but but there are times when he just knows how to <laughs> to, to do something. He's the king of awkwardness, and he when he gets asked about the urn the, isn't it that sitting at dinner there's the urn on the table and the cat knocks it over and then he's talking about milking kittens oh, yeah. <laughs> and that that journey of getting himself into that hole and how he that is just it's always um, Robert De Niro's makes line. me cry <laughs> Yes, I think I, that's probably... I've got nipples, Greg. Can you look me? <laughs> that's it. <laughs> it's, you know, it's not the funniest moment, but for some reason, it uh, literally, no matter how many times I see it, it I cry. I, I can't yeah. breathe. Right. It's very funny. <laughs> Classic oh, stuff. Brilliant. Right, we're halfway through, Miltos. Now we've got a little bit of a surprise for you now. Oh. If you look to your left, we have the Movie Heaven Quiz League table. Oh, Jesus. Yeah. <laughs> That's normally how everybody reacts to, uh, reacts to that. So it's quiz time. Okay. Oh, hang on. Helps if I turn that. We got some nice snazzy music. Yeah. Neil Stark. Nice. There you go. Nice. Okay, Miltos, you have until the cock crows. I'm hopefully you'll be able to hear it through my headphones. Okay. Uh, to answer as many movie questions as possible how, okay how are you on your movie trivia i don't know so it d- depends what movies isn't it well if you ask me mo- anyway go they're on. only they're, they're, they're easy if you know the answers all right are you ready Excellent. right here we go are you going to keep scoring i am here we go who is the chiseled chin star of the evil dead series bruce campbell correct who directed halloween John Carpenter. Correct. What was Robert De Niro's character's name in tra- uh, Taxi Driver? <laughs> he said Travis it. Bickle. Correct. Who voiced John Smith in Disney's Pocahontas? Don't know. Mel Gibson. Huh? What was the name of the clown in Stephen King's It? The, the name of the clown? Yeah. Oh, I don't know the it's name. Pennywise. Oh, Pennywise. The film Trans... Tran- train spotting is from a novel by which author? Irvin Welsh. Correct. Who directed Lethal Weapon? Um, the guy who directed um, Superman. Correct. <laughs> I'll give you that. Thanks. Uh, what is director Kevin Smith's first film? Clark's. Correct. Who voiced the baby in Look Who's Talking? Oh, it's the thing. I don't know. Bruce Willis. Yes, that's it. Who voiced Groot? Uh, Vin Diesel. Correct. Who wrote Chitty Chitty Bang Bang? Stephen Fry. Ian Fleming. <laughs> <laughs> Stephen I Fry. knew it was someone I knew. Anyway. Wow. Yeah, How many was that? That wasn't too bad, Miltos. You got seven. Seven? You are fourth on our board, okay, Miltos. That's all right. That, I, that's good. That's not too bad. That is very good, sir. Well done. Yeah, you'll you'll be, be, you'll be, there is a lot of zeros. We don't... Yes. Uh, we, we don't yeah, make it on the board. Yeah, yeah they're all up on the board. But thank you, Miltos. Yeah. You are now joint fourth on the board thank with you. seven points. Congratulations. That was the quiz. Thank 
Neil. Winter's coming. I <laughs> 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 love it. Very good. <laughs> Seize the day with award-winning ales brewed by Corinium Ales Siren Sister. Check out their Roman collection of classic beer styles, seasonal speciality and one-off brews. Open Friday afternoons for off-sales at Unit 1A, the Old Kennels Siren Sister Park. Pre-booked tours and tastings for small groups available from September 2016. To request more information, email hello at coriniumales.co.uk. Or go to their website www.coriniumales.co.uk. Find them on Facebook at www.facebook.com slash coriniumales. Siren Sister Sales and Lettings are an award-winning agent in the heart of Siren Sister selling and letting properties in the Cotswolds. If you are a vendor planning on selling your property, do not hesitate to call them as they are the agent that does not charge the earth to sell your home. With a fantastic low selling rate of 0.75% plus VAT, minimum charges do apply. Landlords, are you looking for a dedicated agency to manage your rental property or portfolio? Well, they offer a first-class service with competitive rates. For tenants searching for their next new home, you will find their referencing fees competitive, making moving with them more affordable to you. Whatever your property requirements, please do give them a call. Their friendly staff are there to help you. Testimonials can be found by logging on to their website, www.sirencestersalesandlettings.co.uk or please call 01285 652 442. Siren Sister Sales and Lettings, dedicated to you. So, Miltos, favourite screen kiss? What two stars have putted up and you've liked the most? Or is there an iconic scene with a great kiss that you can think of? Oh, the only one that I can think of, the most iconic, is from Gone with the Wind, Clark Gable and... Um um, Vivian Lee. Vivian Lee, and that, and that. I don't. Do they actually kiss? Uh, There's a feeling. I, so at, the end, they do, at, the, they? at the end, no, because he holds her and he goes, and he walks away. Yeah, yeah. that's right. But it's so it? funny yeah. that I always think of it as as a really an intimate moment. But actually, he's. Yeah, there's frankly the idea. I don't her. give a damn. Yeah. yeah. Mm. So there you can you have go. that. That's yeah, the, no, the, that's the, a the, very the, iconic yeah. scene. Because to be fair, I, if you, I would have thought they did kiss. It's not a film that you sit down and watch that often, though, is it? Four no. hours long. It's, a, lo- no, it's a long movie. Tell me about good screen kisses. It's so funny that they well, don't register. When I was it's on your I'm, side, I, yeah. I did the Spider-Man one, the upside oh, down. Oh, yes, of course. That's Because really, I just think it's that's very really, iconic. Yeah, Han, yes. Han and Leia, I think, uh, the carbonate chamber, okay. when she yeah. says, I love you, and he Sh- says, I love you. Know know. Shall I tell you, shall let you into a secret into my subconscious, which I probably shouldn't do this, because it's <laughs> going to be broadcast to people who don't know me, <laughs> but who cares? Um, when you, when, so when you asked me that question, now you're telling me those things. I'm going oh yeah of course those kind of iconic moments mm. and of course I got there with Gone with the Wind that wasn't a kiss but when I first th- th- I think about okay I've got to think of really excellent hot screen kisses <laughs> on film like that's what I was thinking like really good kisses so and I couldn't think of a single one. <laughs> that's what I couldn't think of a single one I mean there was a bit of tongues de- and everything yeah. <laughs> there was a bit of debate because I originally wanted to choose Lady and the Tramp but Pav said it wasn't a kiss and I <laughs> no, think it is sharing, it is a kiss they're I sharing a piece of spaghetti they're yeah, eating but they do a little something they almost them. kiss don't they yeah, so sweet. So Between sweet. Dogs, you're so weird. Yeah. Let's not. Let's not. <laughs> let's, let's, not let's not scratch that scab off again, shall we? We, we, you know, that was like three years ago. Come I on. Know. You've let allowed it, other people to have it. Let no, it just go. <laughs> let, it, let it go. Let it go. Right, Miltos. Uh, your favourite soundtrack and or song? Because they don't seem to do songs anymore. No, they don't. So I've got two. Okay. One is is my very very all time favourite. Uh, soundtrack which is to a film that um i think it's by emir costa rica please forgive me not pronouncing it properly I, i'm trying to see it written down but anyway um and it's called time of the gypsies okay and it's uh 
a film that was made before the Yugoslavia got split up, I believe. And it's a it's an amazing film. And if anyone gets a chance, you've got to see it. It's truly astounding. And the soundtrack is mind blowing. I right. wish you could find it so you could play it. But it's really, really good. The other one is um of do you remember that film? Ellen Page? She's pregnant. Do you know? Oh, do you know? Juno, yeah. I so I don't buy soundtracks very often. Right. When I saw that film, I bought that soundtrack. I just loved it. Mm. I think it's great. That's really, really fantastic. Soundtrack. Okay. Are there any particular movie songs that you like? Because, like I say, they're a bit out of fashion now. The eighties and nineties used to get them all the time. But is there any that? Not really. Not no. really. The things that really are memorable are not originally that have been almost acquired for movies, like the, th- the thing that Tarantino does. Right, Where he right. will take something, you know, and, and kind of re-energise it mm. by putting it in his film. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, I mean, Stuck in the Middle mm. is, like, just amazing. And now, of course, it, it's it's funny. I don't think of the scene when I hear it, but that scene is just so much better because it has that yeah yeah, in it. yeah absolutely you know and so much weirder he's mm. a, he is a master of doing that isn't he he's so clever at with that, his yeah. soundtracks i mean he, he yeah. just uses his own record collection another excellent soundtrack which didn't make me want to buy it but was amazing is uh, there will be blood oh, yes. yes oh yes that guy from radio yeah, yeah. yeah. johnny um oh greenwood Mar- yeah. 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 Green? yeah amazing mm. And no, normally you don't really notice a soundtrack, particularly because it's a period film. But the soundtrack is not period. It's kind of mm. something else, isn't it? It's, it's weird. It's genius. Because yeah. the f- again, the first 20 minutes of that movie is just spellbinding. There's not a single oh, piece of dialogue. No, no. And a lot of times I've actually just watched that first 20 minutes of that movie. Yeah. It's, it's amazing. It's yeah. great. He's yeah. a brilliant filmmaker, one of my favourites. Also, uh, Daniel Day-Lewis, obviously, what a performance. When you're seeing actors like that do you have you got actors that you sort of grew up admiring and and still hold on that pedestal that you admire yeah yeah there are you know the, the, uh robert shaw yeah you know because they were great because i don't know i don't know you know sometimes i think about the way we used to make films and the way we make films now and I sometimes I feel nostalgic but then I just sound like a a, just a miserable old man (laughs) do you know what I mean it's like I don't believe that's the case but I think we still make amazing movies I think movie making has changed a lot but those actors Robert Shaw who's the other one who was uh, in in on the waterfront with Marlon Brando. At Rod Steiger? Rod Steiger. Mm. These kind of heavyweight guys. Mm. Um, and then you have people like Al Pacino and Dustin Hoffman. The, these were fantastic actors, you know, and you could really see what they were doing in, in the 70s. You saw... And it, it wasn't just that they were great actors, but the stories are amazing. Think about things like Serpico mm. and... And Dog Day Afternoon. It's like, could you imagine that film being made now? I can't imagine no, it no, being no, made. No, and uh, and let alone The Godfather. But these were like really interesting stories, and people were making films that were that I don't know. I mean, maybe we're still doing that. Maybe I'm just being nostalgic. So so yeah. But Robert Shaw mainly just because you know when you have someone like that, and then you put them in a what I would consider a modern film like Jaws, and then you just oh, you just kind of like just love the fact that there is a character like that, mm, mm. and you can't imagine anyone else doing it. I think that's it when when actors turn roles into something where you can't imagine anyone else doing them. I think mm. it's really is really special. Like even even you know charlton heston whatever you think about that man's politics and <laughs> no. you know planet of the apes and that iconic moment where he discovers what's happened it's like it will forever be imprinted in my mind well, you can actually a, feel the cry can't you yeah. it actually feels real yeah. rather than watching it on a film yeah 
it's brilliant yeah there's it's, something about those actors yeah. that we just don't because we were talking not long ago about the fact that there there aren't many movie stars around anymore whereas you used to, in those days you used to have mm. movies i mean people like and people like Richard Harris and Oliver Reed, you know, the Hellraisers, the, you know, and, and Robert Shaw. You don't tend to get that these days. Shall I tell you what? I, I was having this conversation with someone yesterday, and, I, and I've got a theory, and I don't know if it's correct, it's just my theory. In fact, it's probably not correct, but, but so think about people like Marilyn Monroe. Think about if they were around today, would they still be enigmatic and iconic would we remember them like that of course her dying young helps a lot but i think in those days we didn't know stuff no we know everything about everyone now yeah we can just read it online back then these actors they were still enigmas we only saw them when we saw them on screen exactly and every so often they'd pop up on parkinson and do an interview and you'd go Oh my God! I didn't know they they spoke like that, or yeah. they scrubbed up well. Yeah. That, and that would be the only time we'd ever notice them. And the rest, it would be sometimes it would be something written in, written in the papers. But now, literally, no one can do anything without mm. anything happening. Well, yeah. Oliver Reed would turn up on Michael Aspel, pissed out of his head, yeah. singing wild things, <laughs> <laughs> stuff like that. Oh, no. And that was still like a, a, a you know like a surprise, exactly. Even though we knew that he was exactly. you know that he had a problem with alcohol, exactly. But but the thing is, is that w- they were enigmas because we just didn't know very much. And I think that's why we re- re- remember them as, as these movie stars. Mm. But I think if any of those people were alive and working today, we would have already got bored of them. Yeah, but I bet Marilyn Monroe would have about three million followers on Twitter. Exactly. And she'd be slagged off all the time exactly. for being a tart. Yeah. Or yeah. overweight. Yeah. 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 I mean, it would be ridiculous. Yeah. And it would be like... Oh, and then and then what would we, everyone would have an opinion, even if we didn't want to have an opinion no. about her, and 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 all that finesse and the reality of who she was, which which whatever she, because obviously uh, I don't know very much about her, but um, she was only judged on the movies that she was in, and yeah. she was in some amazing movies mm. in her short career mm. and i think that's the thing that we've lost now i think we don't we just know too much there's no mystery yeah. is there there's we no mystery too much. absolutely is it my go or yours it's yours oh yeah sexiest movie star that's leads nicely <laughs> on doesn't it <laughs> lovely little there segue go. there sexiest movie star robert downey jr no, okay, mm. yeah. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I was going to say Mila kunis right i was going to say her because i think she is super super hot but 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 i'm i'm balancing it out by by saying robert downey jr just because and i don't know why i say it because he's not like obviously super super hot he's like attractive like everyone mm. else right he's he's you know he plays really kind of like sexy kind of arrogantly confident characters and that's always a little bit sexy but there's something about him that that i've always really admired even when i was really pissed off with him for getting the job of playing charlie chaplin right uh all those things that british actors do you know go yeah. oh god <laughs> <laughs> all this thing that we do yeah. and yeah you watch him and you go oh god i hate yeah. the fact that he's so good at it oh god why yeah and then he's meltdown then coming back that's that's just the thing we were just talking about people doing things like that oliver reed we forget that robert downey jr it's it, a lot of people have forgotten that i mean the guy and was arrested meltdown it was, was as if he'd never his career would never recover yeah, yeah. yeah look at him now exactly sleeping on other people's sofas he was yeah, yeah. amazing yeah very bizarre super, super hot right uh your hidden gem movie you've mentioned a couple already today yeah, that other people yeah. may not have heard of some of them are some of them are what's the other one i i want i want to think of a i want to come out with one that that i've um oh i know what it is well, it's not a hidden gem, but it's it's the vanishing, right? Okay, the original. The let's original. say, yeah. It's so weird, isn't it, when oh. directors remake their movies in America, 
there's only one reason it has to be only one reason i'd love i'd love the director to tell me that he did it because it was like an experiment he was like what actually would happen if i did it with a budget and you know but it's rubbish yeah, <laughs> yeah. It is. You can if tell, you compare it to the original well, you can tell the studio got yeah, involved yeah. can't you uh, yeah if no one's seen it watch the vanishing it's a Dutch film, I believe. It's a, yeah, it's a French slash George Dutch. George Schlusser. Yeah, Dutch film. I love it. I've watched that so oh, many so, times. So I've, I've never seen the original. I've never you seen need to the watch original. it. Right. If that doesn't leave you haunted at the end... Okay. Yeah. It's good. Nothing will. It's I good. mean, I, I think my jaw fell open the first time I yeah. watched that. Yeah. Because you're a, just not a, a, that, And from the very beginning, there's this feeling of... You, you're unsettled and you're uncomfortable and I think that is the best thing about horror the reason why I love horror films so much is is that it I have this theory that that if you can make great ho- if you if you if you have an, uh, an eye and an ear for making good uh, thrillers let's not call them horror films mm. just things that grab you and make your heart race thrillers then you can make anything literally anything and the reason why people like john carpenter and um wes craven and tobe hooper and all of these directors turned into such great you know like poltergeist mm. you know, it's made by tobe hooper it made one of the most shocking horror films <laughs> yeah. of, of 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 the 20th century but the reason why they're so good as directors is because they hone their skills in a in a place where where they were allowed to express their imagination and how you capture a scene you point a camera like imagine you write a script man walks into house gets beaten over the head with a hammer uh door closes all right fine Mm. give that to 20 people in the street to film and you'll get 20 different versions back but the point is is that on paper that's all it is but in our imaginations the way Mm. we remember it we remember the details and it's the details that make these directors so so good because they know how to how to create tension they know how to create atmosphere and they know how to press our buttons Mm. and and that was all done on no money and that is why you know i love horror films so much because these people when they make good ones they they're making high pinnacle works of art mm. I, will, I will always you know people always kind of go oh it's just horror it's like it's not just horror man it's like there should be a category well, there is isn't because people don't make those kind of films anymore some people do like absentia you know yeah. there's, there's still people making those movies but but you know i i think it's a very underrated art form and uh and when you get good ones it's been overtaken because of course the studios realize there's lots of money to be made in films like uh eli roths and and saw mm. and stuff and you know, i kind of got a, a perverse pleasure out of saw mainly because of tobe toby bell yeah because he was so excellent and watchable and you know but 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 it's as far that's as far as it goes really the mm. concept is good it's just that eventually you go oh it's just a franchise like everything else i've been saying and I, I do bang on about it but the french at the moment have been making probably what we've been talking about from the 70s that the americans and that independent chain were, were coming through the crew the french seem to be doing now you know I, i've spoken about martyrs yeah and then <gasps> oh my god that film <laughs> oh my god i can't believe you just said that i've just had a horrifying flashback that was one of the most disturbing <clears throat> things i've ever seen and uh, oh, yeah <laughs> and the way they do that is so real Miltos, think it? of your happy place think of yeah. your happy place quick <laughs> but that, what you said about a work of art because it takes you through every emotion a horror film should do you've got your jump if you want your jump in there you've got a lot of the psychological stuff you got a little bit of gore, I suppose, if you if you're into that. It brings it all together and then just leaves you at the end, just going, "Holy fuck! Yeah. What the hell? And what am it's, I, how- it's an event. It's yeah. an event. It's like it's it's an experience. Mm. It's like you cannot watch, even I mean, whatever you think of that film, and and I, I feel very conflicted about that film because of where it goes. It, it goes further than I probably would. I had no idea a girlfriend at the time got it right and she uh she put it on and uh 
I respect her so much for that. I don't know any other girl who would have found that film and put it on and sat through it and and kind of enjoyed it like I did. I didn't enjoy that film, but but the experience of watching it, it it's you cannot you cannot not be moved by something like that. Mm. Even it there, and you go through intrigue repulsion mm. un- just not believing what you're seeing to curiosity to then it turns into something where it becomes spirit i mean it's like it's the most fucked up film i've ever seen and it takes you there and it goes to places i've never seen anyone go and before. then at the end it leaves you just questioning what the hell did you just see did what happened what was it I, I mean, have unfortunately still not seen I've it. I've still not seen it. it, it no, see I don't it. blame you because if if I knew what I knew, because I didn't know anything about it when I started right. watching it. But if I knew even a little bit of what it, I'm so glad. I I always I love not being spoiled about anything. I don't yeah. like know anything. Right, right. But if I'd ever heard like a Wolf Creek, I still haven't been able to watch all the way through that film right. because I know what it's about. There gets to be like halfway through where I just go, no, nope, switch it off. <laughs> and I always do that because I just can't go there because I know already. But I was saying with some of the other the French films, they have this this thing where it just takes you into a place. It takes you out of a com- completely out of a comfort zone that horror used to do. Like we were talking about with the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, t- took you completely out of your comfort zone. Yeah. And that's what the French are doing at the moment, and they've been doing it so well. And they're just not getting the kudos in this country and the respect that I think they, they truly deserve at the moment. I think the French... I th- I'm so glad you reminded me of that because you're right. They, they've they taken over from where the South Koreans were. Mm, were absolutely. Were selling. Mm. Because the South Koreans were doing a very particular kind of thing. It was very... Almost like bordering on fantasy. It mm. was dealing with, you know, obviously their... their, their um, their culture of kind of mythology and and these supernatural kind of events mm. and that was great but you're right about the french i think they're doing the bravest stuff have the you moment. seen um i must ask this because i've found a fellow <laughs> inside with um patrice Dahl and no. Oh, okay. No, There's another one. <laughs> okay. It's quite hard to take. It's just yeah. literally a two-hander with, a, a, okay. but it's. Okay, Pretty Style, I like that. Yeah, and is, uh, it, is, is it a recent film? Uh, I think it was about two thousand and eight, so okay. not uh, you know eight years or yeah. ten years ago, but yeah. it still will shock you. Okay. Uh, there you yeah. go. <laughs> I love it. You just be really quiet there. <laughs> I know, well, oh, why are I've they heard, talking about horrible I've things? I've heard so many things about martyrs, and it's like you say, it's sort of like part of you wants to think I've got to watch it. You know, it's like going past the car crash. You think I shouldn't really be looking, but you really shouldn't I, be I, looking. I want to look. I want to look. So, well, all I would say is, set yourself down, turn the lights off, like I did. Get yourself a nice steak. Right? Yeah. Okay. No, don't <laughs> do that. <laughs> turn the lights <laughs> off. Doesn't make me want to watch it Because I did all. that. Like I always watch my horror films. I turn the lights you off. You are such a masochist. <laughs> and then halfway through, I went and put the lamp on. Yeah. <laughs> And I'm a hardened horror oh fan. God. Halfway through, I thought, no, I've got to put the lamp on now. That's freaking me. You've got to get the dog in. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to draw those curtains yeah. now. God, yeah. Oh, dear. Right, Miltos, so we are finally at the last question. This question we love to ask is, what would be your movie heaven? What film could you take up to your little white cloud and be able to watch over and over again? We describe it as the sort of film that, if it's halfway through on TV, you would stay and watch the end of it. Oh, God. There's a really, really, really obvious one, and I'm not going to say it. Well, I will say it, but I'm not going to choose it, which is The Godfather. Right. Because it's the only film that, no matter where I've been in the world, it suddenly popped up on television. And no matter what I am doing, and you know it's a long film, Mm. I watch it to the very end. And I don't mean to. Mm. It's just... One and I've seen it so, and I never watch movies more than a couple of times. Maybe not more than once. Uh, and and that film is always a film that I, with whether I like it or not, I watch it to the very end. It pulls you. More in. recently, that's happened with Ava- Avatar. Oh, <laughs> oh really? really? Okay. So weird because I went to see it at the cinema. I was like, okay, it's like all of James Cameron's movies. It even had the same kind of rhythm mm. and moments of danger and t- 
tension. It was like watching The Abyss. It was like watching Terminator 2. It was like watching Aliens. It was like all of that. But it was so well done. And because he's so good, like Spielberg, he's so good at telling a story. Mm. Same with Titanic. It's like... Oh, yeah, all right, we watched it. Yes, okay, that's exactly what we expected. But yet, when it's on, it just can't stop watching it. And the same with Avatar. It's, it's just, it's like crack. <laughs> <laughs> it's, like, it's like crystal meth. It's like you just... Blue See, that, blue should be on, that should be on the poster. Yeah. Avatar is like crack. Yeah. <laughs> but, but really, the one that I will take is my all-time favourite film, just because sometimes I can just freeze it and just just think it's just a beautiful thing to see and that is alien oh Oh, great movie great something i think it's also something that connects me to my childhood because i remember it coming out and i remember the poster and i remember this is the other thing about when you don't know anything Mm. i was a child there was no internet there was no there was there you know we were still riding donkeys to the beat no that's not true <laughs> yeah. I mean, we're in cyprus but 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 you know it's like there was there was i just remember seeing the poster that's all you knew of it i was too young to go to see it in the cinema and i wanted to see that film so much and so for a few years until i actually did get to see it it was just one of those like a like something that I wanted so bad I didn't know anything about it yeah. the post you remember it was like yeah. an egg that's that's right. you didn't even know what you were looking at that's until right. you'd seen the film No, in space no one can, can hear you scream. scream and that's all we knew and that made that film I'm sure like so compelling Indeed. could you imagine that happening now it doesn't happen it's now, a shame does it? It doesn't. No. because that that enigmatic mystery made us want to see it so bad and of course when you did see it there is there's an artistry even when it when when the movie begins and you just get to go through the nostromo Mm -hmm. the beauty of i mean there's real beauty it's like it's a beautiful film and yet at the same time and i think ridley scott is a genius because of this because there's a calmness Mm. and a beauty to everything that he films and then it just the shit hits the fan it's a slow burn of a movie isn't it it really is yeah it really is i think i'd like to take that i think that's a good one absolutely you can have that miltos is there um a director that you would talking to ridley scott is there a director that you would really love to work with yeah but i think it would be someone like Maybe they don't exist anymore. I, I would have loved to have worked with Billy Wilder. Oh, yeah. Because Billy Wilder, who can make a film like Ace in the Hole and also um, Some Like Some It like Hot. Oh, oh. I mean, you know, to, to be able to make those two, two extreme mm. movie, movies, so brilliant. And I bet you, it you know, and working with people like Jack Lemmon and stuff. So, so that would have been wonderful. I, I'd imagine he would be brilliant at doing comedy as mm. well as the intense stuff. But nowadays, I don't know, Justin Lin, I like getting thrown about, so I would definitely do something <laughs> where I get to fall off buildings and stuff. <laughs> I do, honestly, I love oh, I would really? do all my own stunts. Yeah. Okay. What's the, what's the riskiest one you've done then? <laughs> <laughs> the riskiest one was on a TV show, which I did for five years, called Hubbub. It was a kids' TV show. We filmed it in Edinburgh, and it was really s- low-budget <laughs> BBC pro- pro- programme that was on when the Chuckle Brothers wasn't on. Right. And, um, uh, and, uh, and I played Magic Mikey, Les's sidekick, and we had to do all our own stunts. He was a cycle courier, and uh, there was one scene where I had to jump off a a thing and then onto a bicycle so imagine i had to jump off something and land on the saddle of a bicycle (laughs) while it was attached to a truck you could imagine it was it always went wrong but i didn't uh, i you know i was young at the time i was like yeah we'll do it again i can't literally walk but i'm gonna do it again (laughs) we're gonna get this right oh my god they used to put more and more paper down between but you know between my legs and it didn't make any difference by that point i couldn't feel anything <laughs> so yeah that was a pretty <laughs> pretty oh ridiculous goodness. stunt but i i would do all, anything falling off bridges yeah Oh. Wow! One more quick question before um, before we finish, and it would be silly not to with all of this Star Wars stuff around us. What was it like being on the set of the Force Awakens? 
Oh, it was great. It was great, you know, because you get, you know, called up and, you know, Nina Gold cast Star Wars, of course, so she was like, Listen, yeah, you know, JJ would like you to kind of come and just spend a few days doing a little something, well, you know, get you dressed up and all that. Do you want to do you mind doing it? I was like, yeah, of course, let's do it. And you go down and, and the weird thing is that when no one knew anything, Right. None of us knew anything. We didn't know. We turn up on set. I remember going for costume fittings, and even one of the <laughs> one of the costume supervisors going, "Yeah, I'm designing your costume, but I actually haven't read the script." <laughs> oh right. <laughs> it's like there's only a few people have read the script, and not everyone has. <laughs> so, so it was so locked down. I mean, part of that was quite fun, you know, getting turned, turning, being driven into Pinewood, and you know, taken somewhere, and then you know, taken to a, a, um, a caravan with your name on it, but it wasn't actually your name. It was just a code for what you were right. playing. You know, all of that stuff was happening because they didn't want anyone finding out anything. Right. And I remember, you know, we get getting into makeup, getting into costume and having a blanket put over us wherever we had to kind of like go from one studio to the, to the, to the, um, the, the, our, um, Trailer. Trailer, thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> it's been a long day. Um, but but that, the mystery of it all, and then turning up on set and sitting outside it and wanting to kind of look inside and wander around, but you're not you're not needed yet, and you're like and then people coming out and then taking off their heads and going, Oh my god, there was someone inside that <laughs> <laughs> That was crazy. And of course just seeing you know, that Maz's castle, it was just populated yeah. with the most amazing, amazing characters. And then, and then being on the set, there was one thing that got cut out, but I was having this argument with, um, you know, the big guy in the, on the chair, the right. animatronic guy, he's like the kind of the big boss. Yeah. And he, you know, I'd never even seen him. And JJ was like, you know, I have an argument with him. And, uh, uh, and and he's, you know, and I hadn't seen him. So I went, all right, I'll have an argument. And he goes, all right, action. And then suddenly it comes alive i didn't know what it was gonna do so he's like this whole thing was like so unbelievable he's like got a cigar drinking and there's like six people up behind the chair operating his mouth and his smoking and, and talking like this and there's all this chaos going up and i'm like just like cut 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 you do know what an argument is don't you yeah i do know i just didn't i didn't know what it was doing so so he starts again and and so he starts going and i start going like this you know what are you you know don't you talk to me like and then jj was like no 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 the thing about an argument is that someone says something and then you say something you can't talk at the same i said i do know that it's just i don't know what he's doing i don't know what he's doing so there was no script because we were improvising it right so, so so i'm waiting for it so he starts again <laughs> drinking the so i'm waiting for him to stop there's a little breather and i'm back <laughs> it's like okay all right this is what it's going to be like all day and so it was like that all day just oh, trying wow. to film this improvised thing with the animatronic uh, monster um, which you didn't know what it was going to do because the guys couldn't see me they were behind a chair <laughs> what an experience though what an experience. amazing yeah, so you amazing. you basically couldn't see any other set you what you saw is what you were on and then yeah, they took you there um yeah there was no wandering around yeah there was no wandering around i can imagine you were held your hand was held everywhere you went we were even given our scripts they were red they had their name um uh, emblazoned across them they were all numbered probably barcoded and when you turned up in the morning they they the woman would come in and she'd give you the, your, your sides and you'd sign for them and she said you do not take that wherever you read your lines you read your script and then give it back to us wow wow do not take it's the only it way home. to do it now to keep that mystery up because well, the, like the weird you said thing about is, the yeah the weird thing is now is that uh, my agent gets really annoyed about it it says all right, Star Wars, I understand, because everyone wants to know what the story's going to be. But now, everyone, every, and I'm t telling you, everyone is asking you for um, confidentiality clauses. Really? And he's going, it's just now like a fashionable thing. Some small-time, uh, you know, producer is going, oh, yeah, let's put confidentially at confidentiality clauses over all of this and then maybe it might generate some interest. Right, <laughs> right. And so they're doing it with everything. It's yeah, like we're having yeah. to sign, no, we won't talk about it. Mm. 
but who's interested even i mean we don't even know what this story is you know so so that happens a lot now i think it's Uh, become a very fashionable thing yeah yeah Star Wars, I understand it. Oh dear, legend, absolute right. legend. <laughs> so once again, Miltos, you obviously thank you very much for joining us on Movie Heaven. Take Alien up to your little white cloud. That's yours. That is your Movie Heaven thank for you. good. Now that's locked in. And thank you for coming all the way. Thank for you. Humble it's been an shared. absolute treat. I'm really so has. glad I came. I'm so so happy because it's so much better doing it in person. It oh, is. It that really day. is. It that really is. So thank you very much, oh, Pav. Thank you very much, Neil. Um, so we'll be back again soon. So once again, thank you very much, Miltos. Come and join us again yeah. for a movie. I feel so satisfied. I feel like I should have a cigarette or something. Yeah. <laughs> oh, so saucy. <laughs> we are yeah. doing this in our pants, by the way. We yeah. are. <laughs> That's um, a must when you come in this show. Yes. Now we're just going to make Miltus' head up on our wall. Yeah. So if, if anybody asks where he is, unfortunately... You'll find out when this comes Yeah. <laughs> thank you very much, everyone. Yeah, so thank you very much. We'll see you all again soon. You can email us at pancastatlive.com or visit the website at www.pancast.co.uk. This podcast is sponsored by Carinia Mails. For more information, email hello at carinamails.co.uk. And this podcast is also sponsored by Sirencester Sales and Lettings. For more information, go to www.sirencestersalesandlettings.co.uk. Thank you.